So I have an interest in care. Um, and care is a very broad word. Because care is often what people feel for little things. This is Amelia. She was born in 2009. She is the deepest connection I have in life. It's not a little thing. Caring for someone else is probably one of the strongest drivers mankind has. And we heard connection and the word connection and connecting and connectivity all along. That is in every single presentation today. I'm deeply connected to Amelia. She is deeply connected to technology. I mean, as I was taking that <laughs> photograph, she was trying to exchange that old piece of kit with the iPhone I was using to take a photo of her. But having her makes me think quite seriously about what caring is. In my life, I help people who look after other people. And there's a variety of them. So for everything that we design in our company, we, we use this, this persona graph. The chap in the middle is Paul, um, and he's 82. He lives in Bournemouth as early onset dementia, which for those of you that uh, don't know what that is, I mean, it essentially means that he forgets a lot of stuff. He sometimes forgets where he is, but most of the time he's absolutely fine. Paul has deep connections to his children. I mean, we go through ups and downs. Myself and Amelia, I mean, she destroyed half of my record collection. I've recovered from that just. But we stay in touch. And children, in Paul's case, are not any different, despite the fact that they actually live quite far away. Paul receives a lot of support from community nurses, district nurses, that's kind of the going term for them. They're absolute heroes. They visit Paul pretty much every other day because, oh, sorry, I forgot. Paul is also a type 2 diabetic. And that means that someone else needs to look after his blood sugar and his insulin dosage. And that's down to the nurses, who, by the way, if they stop doing that, Paul is not going to live very long. He can't do it himself because he forgets. Now, Paul also needs a lot of help for what we call in technical terms the activities of daily living. And usually he gets that from social care workers. I mean, social care workers are probably the most underappreciated role in our society. In my experience, a social care worker saves a life a week. And that's a bad week. Social care workers are absolute heroes. And of course, I mean, our press makes them a massive disservice by throwing up the news of very few ones that are bad eggs. Now, our role in this is to look at these relationships, at these connections. And what we do is essentially look at how information that is exchanged between, say, nurses and Paul can be used to improve Paul's well-being. Now, we spoke a lot about well-being today, so I'm being a bit brave and bold by mentioning well-being as a word. There isn't a single definition for what well-being is. In some cases, and I'm going to throw a shocker, well-being is actually a DNR close to Paul's name, which essentially means do not resuscitate. Because you know what, I'm quite happy, and if I go, I want to go. I don't want you to keep on resuscitating me. So looking after someone and looking after their well-being isn't ethically straightforward. Now, because dementia is a fairly new disease, well, it isn't, but the volumes of it in, in our society uh, are new, the way we look after people is being challenged. And of course, in the relationship between nurses and Paul, that relationship, that connection one-to-one -one is extremely important. But the information that is exchanged between them isn't shared across the rest of the people that look after Paul, and we're going to go around them. So social care workers also exchange a lot of information with Paul. I mean, they go up in the morning, they, they help 
Paul get out of bed and uh, get dressed. They offer him breakfast. And there's a lot of conversation and a lot of relevant cues in those interactions. But again, those cues are recorded on paper because they need to satisfy the requirements of Care Quality Commission and uh, they'll go into a folder. And essentially, we are recruiting social care workers to be bold hearts, full of empathy, and then we treat them as archivists, really. And then there's the family. Did I mention they live far? Now, they have a strong connection to Paul. They care deeply about Paul. And their constant worry is not knowing when the nurse went in. And by the way, is the sugar high or low? Is daddy exercising enough? By the way, did the carer go in this morning? Did he have a, his breakfast? And what time was that? Did he have some eggs? And they never know about it because, you know what, it's all in paper. Plus, the way we care about people these days completely ignores two angles. Friends. I mean, friends are left completely out of this picture. And communities. I mean, there are plenty of groups out there. It can be neighborhood watch, but it doesn't need to be organized groups. It can be the independent coffee shop that looks after Paul when he goes around and uh, will probably give the family a call if they can, if they're allowed. Now, technology is changing a lot of this. But one of our pet peeves is, is bad technology. Uh, because actually technology has been in the care sector for quite a long time, but it's done itself a disservice. But that's changing. In monitoring a person's life, nowadays we have more devices than ever before. And that's due to uh, another trend, which is the trend for self-quantification. We want to monitor everything that we do in our own lives and have loads of data, which um, for a regular human being is a perhaps a bit too much, but if we're looking after someone, that's just the sort of kit we need. This is Vessel, it's still a, a, a prototype, but essentially it's a, it's a drinking vessel, it's a glass, and it tells you exactly what's inside it. It's connected to the web, and it's able to constantly document what a person is, has been drinking. I look forward to getting something similar for food because recording what a person eats is an absolute nightmare. And because it's recording on paper most of the time, it's absolutely useless. Recording activity. We all seen variations of this. I mean, this one is particularly well designed. It's by Jawbone. It's called Up Plus. It uploads a number of steps that a person takes in via phone into the web, into the cloud. A sense mother. I use these for absolutely everything. I actually monitor my sleep with one of them. I monitor my steps with one of them. It also monitors my temperature. It throws a lot of data into the cloud as well. There's more. There's such devices that are particularly designed to uh, raise alarms and help Paul when Paul needs help. I mean, it's, it's a bit alarmistic. Uh, it kind of sounds like it was designed for a person of old age, which I personally dislike, but um, they can be useful. Now, we've all seen uh, devices for um, panic alarms, I mean, pendants, that are usually a choice of multiple tones of grey with a red button, and they wear it around their uh, neck, and they, they're essentially a label calling them old. That's changing. I mean, this watch, it looks pretty good. Uh, it has a GPS tracker built in and a, an alarm button. And if a person is lost, completely lost their bearings, they can push a button and a voice communication is open and the operator at the other end of the line can actually know where the person is and get someone to, to, to recover them. Plus, people with medical conditions obviously need medical devices, and medical devices are changing to come into the um, consumer sector. Um, this is an example by Withings. People can get their own blood pressure. Again, blood pressure goes into the cloud, is, up is, is uploaded, and people can then check historic records. And it goes on. I mean, Fraunhofer Institute has been working on a mobile robot with the intention to create an artificial companion. Um, 
it's interesting because as soon as we mention these people usually tend to think, oh, but are we replacing people with robots? No, we, we aren't. Because essentially, um, robots are just going to extend the periods in which a person has company from the usual, say, one hour a day into 24 hours a day. We hopefully expect that the robot will not replace anyone. And yet, care records are managed like this. This is how most care providers record the activities of their daily life. It's amazing, really, because the opportunity with all sorts of buzzwords coming our way in terms of big data, data mining, creating all sorts of uh, artificial intelligence algorithms to use data to improve people's lives are not being used here. And that's what we want to do. That's my purpose in life. I want to create three things. And some of these have been created. Some of them are in use by hundreds of people at the moment. I want to create an event triggers timeline that records information about a person's life, but do it in a way that people don't actually need the concept of going into a couple of websites to see if they slept enough or a couple of websites to see if they drank enough. This is actually prosthetics for memory. This is, oh, what have I done this morning? Let me have a look. Okay. Because that's the bit that is missing. And as soon as Paul has that, he can have a pretty normal life most of the time. We want to develop products for care recording that don't involve a single piece of paper. And we want to develop connected care plans. Now, this is now live. Um, we have been um, testing, uh, currently probably testing is the wrong word because we have uh, over 20 care providers in the country using uh, these devices. And the stories that started coming out are nothing short of, in my case, life changing. We are integrating it all. We are integrating information from dozens of devices, from hundreds of interactions uh, every day. And what we're doing with that is making sure that we have the right algorithms running on top of all of this data to improve the well-being of the people receiving care. So it's all about technology, but no, actually it's all about the people. And I'm going to tell you three stories. Now, Paul and John, this is actually a nice talk photo. Uh, I didn't want to use their photo. Um, now, Paul is the youngest. He lives with their parents in Barcelona. And uh, John lives in Slough. Um, and he is getting older. And the encouragement for going out for a walk is becoming a bit harder. So out of assessing that relationship, and after a couple of interviews, we just worked out that, well, hang on. Um, John quite liked walking. Um, what if they both wear one of these activity trackers and we just kind of play them against each other? And they started doing that. And it's now been six months. And for the last three months, there wasn't a single day when granddad didn't go for a long walk because he's constantly trying to hit our number, uh, the number of steps that his grandson did. But most importantly, there is a connection there, a connection between two human beings that are blood related that would otherwise only be connected via Skype and perhaps the odd Christmas do. Now, this is Rosemary. Rosemary is one of these fascinating characters. Um, she is one of the senior carers at a local care home. And Rosemary has been providing care for others for over 20 years. When we first presented the concept of not using paper, when she was puzzled, seriously puzzled. Well, how does that work? Because currently I spend about an hour to an hour and a half every day, head down, recording what I've done. Because Betty from room three was lifted into the wheelchair and we transferred her into the living room and we gave her breakfast and she had this and that for breakfast and that was that. 
Now, after months of using a cleverly designed product, if I say that myself, the product actually learns what is normal for Betty. And after a month, Rosemary finds herself swiping tasks and just confirming, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, she has done that. And now Rosemary doesn't stop talking about how much longer she's spending looking after people, which is, by the way, what she loves doing. That was the best raise she has ever got. And finally, I'm going to talk about Mary, because Mary is not the stereotype of old person. I mean, she um, is midway through her 60s. She looks healthy, uh, but she suffers from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, it's just one of those things that if well managed, um, she can have a perfectly good life. She gets a couple of visits uh, every week from volunteers, volunteers who are uh, usually uh, nursing students. Um, she also gets regular visits from district nurses. Now, because the visits from district nurses happen, say, every month, what keeps happening is that the nurse goes in, they have a conversation, Mary goes into a behavior uh, mode that enables her to manage the condition well, Two or three weeks down the line, that behavior changes, and she goes into an acute uh, shortness of breath. She doesn't manage it very well, and she's admitted into hospital, despite of the fact that volunteers visited, and volunteers spotted that there was something wrong, but the volunteers didn't even have the phone number for the nursing team. Now, before we introduced a way of recording care where volunteers and community and family and nurses can essentially coordinate themselves around Mary. Mary was admitted into hospital six times in a year. Since they've been using the system, she hasn't seen a hospital. And that's essentially because the connections are there where they weren't before. So we'll keep on trotting along, designing products, using lots of technology, but the key difference and my key angle in life, and this resonates with a couple of other speakers uh, you heard earlier on today, is that despite of how much technology we use, um, how beautiful and advanced the technology is, if we don't make it about the people, then it's useless. Thank you very much.